Hey, everybody. everybody. Welcome back to the show. Hope everybody's doing good tonight. Um, how's Dan doing? Good, good. <laughs> Is it, uh, you feel lost right now, not being able to go hunting after work? Yeah, it's kind of weird. <laughs> yeah. What's a, uh, that that's always like i think it's a it's a more weird feeling whenever you shoot one and you can't go anymore but it's still season you know yeah that's a yeah it was kind of strange better feeling. it's like the total opposite seasons because uh last year day five i shot that buck and i was pretty much done in wisconsin yeah and uh, this year i went all the way to the end yeah oh well have you uh started scouting at all yet uh not really it's on my yeah, mind you, though I, i'm uh, been, itching uh, to get out so um i've had things to do just about every night so well you guys just got done with all your workshops right i'm gonna have some time this weekend and around this weekend and even some weeknights i'm gonna get out i'm gonna get out as much as i can yeah um, i'm really got a mission to go after a couple of uh different bucks that uh that i know of yep Yep. Jacob found one piece of a puzzle for you this weekend. Sure did. Sure did. He found <laughs> half of the 10 pointer I've been hunting. Um, but it's not this year's shed, it's last year's shed. And what's yeah. interesting about that is is uh that's the same spot where on video uh in rut I went back there to hunt and found that big shed. That big shed was laying about 20 yards from this shed. So both those big bucks shed the, those antlers on that island. They're two different deer. Yeah. Um, last year, you know, they had to be on there pretty much the same time. And we did workshops there last year, too. So mm -hmm. they had to shed after the workshops. So they almost had to be there together. It's, it's kind of weird. I kind of wondered if somebody would find a shed on there because uh, I didn't really look. And when I do find sheds, that's usually where I find them in that area for whatever mm -hmm. reason like the winter out there probably because everything else is so wide open that and people are walking around a lot at this time of the year yeah it's not that big area either to be holding two two bucks or i didn't if i'm thinking the right spot at least i mean it's a island right well uh, there's usually there's usually a few good bucks in that area um that island is small but they got bedding adjacent to it that's pretty big okay um, but this year uh um i was on to uh, two bucks. One of them might have been the one that I found the antler from, and one of them was a big twelve pointer. I kind of mm -hmm. talked about it when I shot that buck last year. That there was a twelve out there too that I wasn't sure if it was still alive. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, later on after that, I was sure he was alive, but right. now he got killed. He got killed. He got shot, and he and he, and a real big eight got shot, and and uh, now I just got that ten. Yeah. Yeah. Well. It's always nice to find like a big shed in the area that you're, uh, um, you know, yeah, well, you kind of got to track one. Also, because that's not real close to where I'm hunting that deer. So yeah. it, it, it put the puzzle in that, okay, now I know he goes out this way too. So. Be cool to, um, be cool to shoot that deer next year. Cause it'll yeah, be a I big one. I don't know what I'm going to do with the rest of the season when I shoot that thing opening day. Right. Sneak into Jacob's house and steal the shed from him. Yeah. I told him no. he's got a requirement to sell it to me if I shoot the deer. <laughs> I usually don't really uh, care about shit. So, but uh, I, I had that once. Uh, one time, me and a buddy uh, were out scouting, and uh, he found a shed off of a really big buck I was hunting. It's still one of my biggest bucks. I ended up shooting it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we actually, we kind of found it together. We both saw it, and we both had shed, and we ran over there. Yeah, right. And, and I, I, he just said, well, you don't even care about sheds anymore. Uh, all right, you keep it. But if I shoot the buck, I get it. And he's like, okay. It was kind of like a pact, you know, and I shot the buck and he would not give me that shed. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, yeah. I, uh, a guy I go to church with shot a buck uh, that I have I, this one side too. I got to give it to him. It's hanging up there. Something. I keep forgetting to bring it to, uh, to church with me, but it's like a, when the year I found the sheds, it was about 140 inch. When he shot, it was about 150. You know, it didn't it didn't make a big jump, but a decent jump. Um, I got to remember to put that in the truck to take it in there with me. But you want to get into our news story so we don't keep Ryan waiting too long here? 
Sounds like a good good idea. Hey, hey Ryan, guys. how's it going? Hey Ryan, how are you? Everybody, this is a uh, Ryan Pummel. He's from uh, around Traverse City, Michigan, right? Yep. Ryan, and uh, he was at Dan's workshop this weekend, and he had a really unique uh, deer that he shot uh, in Michigan, and we thought it'd be a good news story because I don't. Dan, you said you'd never seen anything like like this, have you? Well, wait. Now I okay. seen a deer one time, a spike buck, not a mature buck like his, but I seen a spike that had uh, spots down the spine on each side. Mm-hmm. And you know what the funny part is? You know where I saw it? Michigan. Yep, Michigan. Right in the thumb, <laughs> armpit of the thumb, the little pit. Oh, did you do? It's like so, by, uh, Bay City or something like that. So, uh, just so everybody knows what we're talking about, Ryan shot um, this buck right here. And let me get to a better picture of it here. But it's a, it's a clearly a really nice, nice buck. Oh man, just a second, everybody. What are you doing on Facebook? Um, it's a, it has spots still though. Yep. Um. Wow. Yeah. You can see on the on the side of the the buck there. And Ryan, you were saying earlier that a lot of people were telling you it's a it's a they thought it was a pie ball deer. Yep, and that's what yeah, I it thought. It just does not look like any pie ball I've ever seen. Because there's no like blotchy white or it's tan, possible, just like a fawn or a fallow deer. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. it just looks like a, it just looks like a, uh, a fawn that never lost its, you know, or you know, a mature buck never lost its spots growing up. Yep, and uh, even a trail camera picture of it too. Well. Yep, there it is. Wow. Is that so even so, even when it was a uh, 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 winter cape, a fall cape, it still had the spots. Yeah, yeah that's in November. I did that, uh, is that a different year? I mean, it looks like a smaller rack. Yeah, that was the year the year before. So he he absolutely blew up from about two to three, three probably years yeah. old. Did you know about him? I guess obviously you did if you had this picture, unless it's someone else's picture. Yeah, so I saw I saw this picture and I thought it was really cool, but then I didn't give it much thought because we never got another picture of him. That mm-hmm. that was the only time we got a picture of him that year. And by the by the time next season came around, I I wasn't even thinking about it. Yeah. So full body you- mount or what? That I was gonna do that, um, but then the cape uh, spoiled. When I was driving oh, back up, no, but you're kidding me. But the good That's... thing is, the shoulder mount still has those spots going up his neck and everything. So, yeah, you can see it goes all the way up to the base of his neck right here. Yeah. yeah. That's crazy, man. It's a nice deer too. Really nice deer. So you didn't you didn't shoot this one up up by uh, where you live at then? No, this was so my family. They've had a farm for going on four generations or so and that's kind of a spot we always go to um year in and year out and most of it's probably 60 percent of it is corn or soybeans or wheat um and then there's like a river bottom and some good bedding areas and crp that they like to be into gotcha so could you clearly see the spots when he was coming in yeah so It was, I think it was like October 19th or 18th. And I was set up right on a field edge. And then it was kind of a little transition area and bedding to the west side. And this tree kind of had like a, like a, we call it a crooked tree because it kind of comes up and around. So when you stand up, the tree's going out to your right. And you're just kind of looking right over towards the bedding. And it was probably 830 or so. And you know how you always hear something and you slowly turn and look and he he showed up um automatically i started shaking and you knew it was out. him right because right I, I knew it was him because it was it was good light at that point and he was super his hide was super light and then those spots just stuck out like nothing and he he was oblivious he had no idea i was in the tree and he actually he came about eight or ten yards um, perfect broadside shot. And as soon I hit him, and as soon as I hit him, he took like two quick steps. 
And then he stopped. And he didn't like do anything. He didn't he didn't book it. He didn't start to like hot wobble with the heart shot. Sometimes they do. And he was just he just ate the arrow. And he kept mm-hmm. on feeding and walking north of me. And as I'm looking at him, I can see the hole like right, right behind that crook of that elbow, but low. So I was thinking, I didn't, I didn't know what to think at that point. I'm just watching the deer kind of slowly bleed out and just continue to feed and eat. He ended up going east into the field and he just kept eating and eating and eating. And it was probably about 30, 40 minutes of this stuff, just watching him. And I'm, I'm still in the tree. Like, what am I going to do? What is, what, what's the, what's the next, uh, the next thing I got to do here. And he ended up kind of working almost like an entire circle around me back to where he came from initially. And I threw a grunt at him in between that. And he didn't, come busting in or anything but he kind of just kept on checking stuff out and came on the same path as a first shot and he got about probably 20 25 yards away from me but he's facing me this time and then he decides to turn around and just kind of walk off and at that point i'm thinking do i let him go if i let him go is he gonna survive this shot so I, I knocked an arrow real quick and he, I mean, he was cording away. He was pretty much facing directly away from me. And I just threw another arrow at him and heard a big slap and he booked it. He booked it towards the river bottom and, um, and I didn't hear anything across the river. So I kind of let it sit and I was a couple years younger then. um, and got it too excited and started getting lost in two different blood trails, kind of walking around trying to figure out what's going on. And um, I ended up getting my cousin and we started trying to get back on the blood trail a couple hours later. And at one point I just said, I'm going to go check the river. I'm just going to walk the river edge and see if he piled up next to it or somewhere near it, or at least get back on the blood trail and, so I'm kind of walking down this river bottom right next to the creek. And I get about five yards away from this deer. I, I couldn't see him. And he just pops up and just takes off like a rocket. And my heart sank. Hmm. I was even more frustrated, not being patient enough, because I didn't really know where I shot him or if that first shot was good, if the second shot was better. And so I just said, okay, I'm giving him. I'm going to give him some time. So we came back that night and we, he ended up um, toppling over in about probably 60 yards from where he jumped up. And Mm -hmm. as soon as I saw him, I mean, he was just, he was, he was a good sized deer. um, But those spots, I mean, I was just, it's kind of one of those times where it's so surreal. you, You just, you don't know what to do about it. And it was, it was so much fun. Um, and I actually found out that a neighbor was actually getting him on trail cam quite a bit. And he was really mad that I had, I got him. So but yeah, after, after two shots, one like right, right in the brisket, I think. And then the other one went in through his hip and out the same side. Um, I don't know which one did the trick, but. After, is, after a long, long track, we finally got on him, but oh, that's good. Fun. Um, did, did you ever like actually get a hold of any kind of expert about it or like a deer doctor or anything? I <laughs> biologist, I remember like DMing Michigan DNR once about it and they they never got back to me. Um, but I'm thinking about actually calling a local biologist and they probably won't can't do much with any DNA or anything, but they might have a clue of if this has happened before, if it's kind of a genetic anomaly, maybe just downstate in Michigan. I'm not sure. Yeah. Like 
Dan tell him tell, saying about the you saw a a spike that had spots just on its back though. Yeah, with just uh, one line on each side of the yeah. spine. Yeah, like you could t- like I I could like I could see that happening. You know, maybe. Uh, and they were like kind of thing. faded, but you could physically see it from a tree stand. Yeah. And that was earlier in season, and they still kind of had a little reddish cape, I think, if I remember correctly. So, I mean, this is a lot different. I mean, that's – Yeah. It almost looks like he shot a follow deer or something, but it's in Michigan. Yeah. You know, it's <laughs> right. crazy. Right. I thought maybe it could be a farm buck, but he didn't have he didn't have tags on him. I don't well, even a farm buck shouldn't have spots like that. I mean – Yeah. Nah. Yeah. No, that's just, uh, just a crazy anomaly, and it's yeah, just – Yeah, he uh, looks – he looks healthy and everything. Looks, you know, obviously blew up the though. lottery. I mean, it's, it's probably about the same odds of shooting the world record. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's something I'll, I'll always, I'll always cherish. And he ended up, he ended up scoring, I think, one thirty-eight with deductions. So, yeah, that looks a nice deer. Um, yeah, you'd, you'd have got him on that first shot if you would have picked a spot. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Those aiming small, miss small at those spots. So, after you shot him, did he just run out into the field? Then is that? I heard someone comment on why you didn't shoot him again when he was standing there. He's probably just too far away, right? Oh, too far away, and yeah. I mean, I was kind of just enthralled in kind of what what is this what is this deer doing right now? Yeah, mm-hmm. and there wasn't as much cover, and so I was just watching him, and yeah, well, yeah, he shot him with sure. a bow. Yeah. So anyway. Well, man, we'll let we'll let you go. We appreciate you um, letting us look at him. Yep, of course. On the on the show here, so uh, congratulations on it. Ryan. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, guys. Yep, have a good one, Ryan. Thank you. See you. You too. Right. Take care. Pretty cool buck. Yeah, remind me of that one I shot at Dave's that I shot twice. It was kind of the same hit. I hit it low, right behind the uh, uh, front leg, and the through yeah. brisket. Yeah. And it just took two jumps and looked around and, and just came walking right back in. And then I shot it again. And then I then I killed it. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. You um, got pretty lucky there. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Seemed like a nice guy, too. So um, you ready to get into our, our topic, postseason scouting? Sure. All right. Everybody, before we start here, um, if you're – new on here just ask questions in the comments and we'll try to answer them at the end of the the show um also if you like what we're doing give us a subscribe and a, and a like and yeah i think that's it um all right it's uh it's after season now and we preach on here all the time about how this is probably the most important time of the year to um shoot a big buck for next year um I was going to. It's actually like a, a regeneration of my uh, spirit and stuff. I mean, you, you get a little yeah. of that bow hunter burnout at the end. And, and uh, I mean, I'm still loving it. Don't get me wrong. But it's a little more of a grind and a push. But now all of a sudden, I'm like all excited for uh, the scouting. Yeah. Yeah. It's honestly like like pound for pound. It, it, it's probably my favorite time of the year to be out and about doing things, you know, in, in the woods. It's like I, I really enjoy scouting. And don't get me wrong, I, I mean the the favorite part for me is whenever you're you get on a big buck and you're hunting a big buck down. But uh, this is uh, definitely part of the process I I really love. Um, anyway, right now, like, do you focus on new properties right now, or are you since like all your hunts are kind of fresh in your mind, you go around to like places you already uh, uh, like hunted this year or scouted in the past and try to like fine tune your your properties that you've kind of already a little of all of that, but there seems to be like a system to it. So uh, the first thing I want to do, the first thing I want to do is go back and find the deer that I left. So if there's deer that I've seen during the season, didn't have a shot at one came out of a bedding area and I didn't know about that bedding area, or I just went in there and set up on sign. I want to go in there now and learn it. I want to see why he was there. What was going on with every buck I saw that I thought was a potential buck. I want to learn why they were there. Even if they were killed, I want to know in case another one shows up, what was going on there. And then I also want to um, really look over the areas where I'm onto something big. 
and uh, really pick out my trees and all that stuff. And then after all that, and then I want to start um, focusing on new properties and looking at more stuff and branching out. Yeah. That seems like what I'm like, I do frantically right now is try to, um, uh, I always have a couple deer that I know live throughout the season and I'm trying to figure them out right now, or I'm trying to scout new areas that are adjacent to where I've had encounters with him or trail cam pictures to, you know, see if he's over here. Where the heck is he? If I didn't see him during season or, you know, um, trying to pick up his sheds or anything like that right now. Um, before I forget you guys, uh, up there in Michigan ha or Jesus up there in Wisconsin, um, you typically have a whole bunch of snow on the ground. Is that like a, is that ever frustrating for you or do you feel like you can still read enough sign when there's a lot of snow to be productive? No, uh, it's frustrating, but I can, I can scout with snow. Um, but I, I miss some. So, I mean, uh, I'd rather not have it, but rest assured our snow's already gone. We hit, yeah. uh, what was it? 40 today or whatever. And it's just, there's a couple piles here. There are a couple spots that are shady. Snow's pretty much gone by this weekend. There won't be anything. I don't think. Yeah. Where I'm at. Um, I'm sure further North there is. Yeah. Uh, one of my buddies, Brad, uh, was asking me about that. He said, you know, they, they're up where he's way up North and was got a whole bunch of snow. I think, um, mm -hmm. he just felt like, felt like he misses, you know, scrapes or whatever, uh, or, or not. Oh, yeah. but, uh, mm -hmm. trails and everything else and it's better to hunt without the snow i mean the problem with the snow is too is it's covering up the trails it's covering up the scrapes you're more mm -hmm. guessing at the beds i mean i got a good eye for it i can see a round spot and know it's a bed because of exactly where it's located i don't yeah. think your average guy can do that and but it does still even me leaves me a little bit guessing a lot of what i'm looking at isn't where deer are now i think people get that you know confused i have people all the time go oh I don't even think the deer are in the same place they are in the fall. Why are you scouting now? I'm like, what mm -hmm. don't you get? I'm not scouting deer. I'm scouting sign. I'm looking at mm -hmm. where they were last fall. So when I'm looking at beds and stuff, I'm not looking at current beds. I'm looking at where they were last fall. And that's what a lot of people don't get. And, and the snow will cover up the tracks. It'll cover up the trails and stuff like that. Yeah. You can still kind of see them, but you're, you're, you're kind of, uh, you kind of got to scout with faith with the snow. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. That's one thing I don't have to deal with down here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is nice. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't like snow in a lot of, for a lot, a lot of different reasons. That being one of them. I like like the first snows of the year um, that we get up here because especially if it's in season or right at the end of the season, because mm -hmm. the deer are still kind of, you know, in a, a mode of where they're going to be next fall at about the same time. Right. And you can kind of follow them through the snow and you can learn a lot following a buck around, you know, some size, you know, um, so snow helps you in some ways, but finding the bedding areas for November and September and October, you kind of, you're better off without the snow. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, so some of these like, uh, areas you're going to go into and, and scout that maybe are going to be new locations after you've, kind of filtered through some of the areas you're familiar with, or, you know, there's a big one in, um, how, how, how do you decide like, uh, these the new locations are going to be worth hunting in, in the fall? Like what are some of your, your keys on that? Uh, you know, um, I've noticed that, uh, most of the spots that I scout that are new tend to be spots that I've gotten some Intel about. Yeah. Somebody's told me about some big buck, um, um, I've heard about a couple bucks being shot there and it's not just a fluke a couple years in a row. You hear about some giant buck there and, uh, I, I, uh, start looking at it on a map, start looking at some stuff, look at the little pieces around it, see if there's anything that's kind of, you know, looks overlooked. Then I'll go take a drive by and then I'll dive in. Um, but I do, um, kind of randomly look at areas too. I like to know all the, you know, nasty swamps. I mean, sometimes you hear about a property that just opened, mm -hmm. you know, they just bought it or, uh, or it's a property that's like a, say it's a park or something. And now because of overpopulation, they opened it up or, um, I like to look at those too. The first year or two can be really good before there's been a yeah. gun season. 
Right, right. Um, I did that today. I, there's a, a piece of public that uh, um, I've never been in on, and uh, a couple of guys on that private side of the public um, were telling me like they used to go spotlighting down there, and they just see giants out in these fields, you know, and I'm like, I got to get in there and, and scout that area. It's a little bit of a drive from my house, but I went in there this morning and, and scouted it out, and I actually threw a couple, a few trail cameras uh, in there. And I mean, there was some just awesome signs, something though, I get, um, I get stuck on sometimes a certain deer. Like if I've had ex like, um, experience in an area where I, you know, had a deer on trail camera that I wanted to shoot from last year, uh, or I've, you know, had an encounter with it. I kind of find myself wanting to go hunt that particular deer because I, for some reason in my mind, I think, you know, it's like a vengeance thing. Um, mm -hmm. and I, sometimes I, I like, I think I handcuff myself, uh, when I shouldn't, I should probably be jumping around a little more, uh, and hunting some of the other spots that I scouted in the fall. That, that, that works two ways. I mean, um, um, I've always done my best by going after deer I know about. I mean, if you look at my walls, most of the really big stuff I've, I've shot, I was hunting when I shot it. Yeah. Not to say I'm always hunting those deer. I do a little bit of that bouncing around. But mm -hmm. I think uh, when you dedicate yourself to an area where a big buck lives, you can hunt that area down if you know it well, and you can, you know, you'll get a, a, an opportunity at it. I mean, um, if you're in swamps, there's only so many points, fingers, and, and uh, layouts that they can be. If you're in the mm -hmm. hills, like you are, there's only so many ridges, points, and, and uh, benches they could be on. Yeah. And uh, when you start thinking like that, he's there someplace, and if there's only 20 or 30 spots he could be, I mean, your odds are pretty good. So yeah. I, I think, uh, I think actually, in my opinion, going after the uh, the brass ring or the you know the trophy is the the, the way to go. Yeah, yeah. I, I just going. I always like mm, this fall. Like I I'll, I only hunt a small fraction of the places that I end up scouting. You know, and, yeah. well, and me even too. some what, some of the ones that I think are just like this this place is dynamite. You know. Like this place I was in today, I mean, there's just giant rubs everywhere and big tracks already. You know, I there's deer living in there right now. And um, I just thinking to myself, oh, my gosh, you know, would I be better off spending time in an area I know I'm going to hunt because I know there's a certain deer there. Uh, but you learn every uh, learn when you go into the woods, you know. Yeah, I mean, there's going to be a point where I'm going to have all the spots scouted where I've got bucks I want to kill next year that I've that I'm following from this mm -hmm. previous yeah and i'm gonna have all those scouted and i'm not gonna want to just keep pounding that and mess it up because i'm gonna know it mm -hmm. and then i'm gonna go out and scout other stuff and i'm probably not gonna end up hunting her yeah but i could discover something i uh you know i could discover some giant buck number one number two something might happen where i find out there's a buck in there or there's a buck in there in a year or two and i'm gonna know yeah. where to go I'm going to know yeah. where he's going to be based on where the buck betting is. Um, because that, that big buck betting doesn't end when you kill the deer. That The next one moves in there. Yeah. Well, so it might be five years down the road if a big buck moves in. Or maybe the betting changes slightly because of uh, ash tree die off or, or something. But it'll still be the same general spot. It'll be right in that area. Maybe it moves mm -hmm. 20, 30 yards. But, but um, those spots just repeat year after year after year. So if you learn a swamp. Then you have that in your back pocket if a big buck ever shows up there. If you glass that one day and see a giant buck out in the field, you go, oh, I know where to go after him. So I like to know every property in as big a radius around my home home mm -hmm. as possible. Yeah. Something else I always do is I, uh, like this property, I, I brought, I just use like cheapo cameras, but um, I dropped three, you know, regular SD card trail cameras over just some, some scrapes that I, that I, you know, looked real productive that was in there. And, you know, I may not make it back in there until, um, you know, the end of next year or whatever to, uh, if I, if I don't hunt there or anything, but, you know, I may, you know, there might be 190 inch deer in there, you know, and then I'll know that for next year, hopefully if he's on that one of those cameras. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's something I've, you know, then maybe that spot will be the spot next year where I'm like, that's where I'm hunting at, you know, trying to chase that deer around. You just never know. Uh, 
just that area has the potential to have some really big deer in it. You know, that particular county is known for big deer. So, um, anyway, I was uh, kind of talking to some just people, uh, some of my buddies about what, what we wanted to talk about tonight or what they, they would want to ask you. So I had a kind of uh, a pile of questions, not a pile, but a few that we could talk on for a while um, tonight. Um, someone was asking, was asking like uh, in your new locations are that you're going into scouting, are you actually picking out the tree you want to set in for deer season or do you kind of just wait until season comes around to, to um, pick out the actual tree for setting I'm up? Picking, I'm finding the bedding and following it back to the tree and I'm making sure I, I know my, know everything about it. So when I leave, I only go in there once. I figure out where he's living. I figure out how close I can get with without uh, when he's in there living, right, during the season, mm -hmm. um, where I'm not interfering with his scent, his sight, or his hearing. And I'm going to be as close as I can. And I'm going to find a tree. I'm going to find that tree now. And if there's something I got to do, alter, like push over a dead tree or break a branch or two off to get up that uh, tree, I'm doing that now. Um that's not how all my hunting is, but that's how I set up the spots when I find them. Now there are spots when you go in there and you look at them and there's several ways a deer comes out of there. There's uh, 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 serious wind issues. Like you think that the deer is going to be in there when there's going to be a wind blowing kind of towards them. And you might kind of look at several options of trees, but you have that knowledge. You figure out which trees you want to be in exactly how far you want to get, how close you want to get to that bedding and uh exactly where you want to set up and how you want to access that yeah i know all that before i leave when i go in there i think that's yeah. a common trait with people is that when they first start this they get really excited to go in they find bedding that's just unreal all big rubs and stuff yeah. and they really don't learn it and then when they go in there they blow it yeah yeah i'm i'm, I'm guilty of that sometimes um um i seem to not not pick out a tree this time of year i don't know why i mean i guess it's worked out for me but it's i wish i was better at that um mm -hmm. more more diligent but i don't know and also uh we don't have we have green up until freaking almost december like there's, <laughs> there's leaves on the trees you know um so it's a lot different right now than it is during during deer season but you know I well, can it's still a lot do, different here than it is during deer season too um, yeah, not to the extreme that you have it, but I mean, September is pretty leafy here and right now there ain't a leaf anywhere, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. You guys are quite a bit earlier than us. Um, okay. Another common thing that we, uh, people will have a, a question on is if there's like, um, how do you tell, uh, exit route from a bed? So, so you, you know, you found a bit nice buck, but how do you tell the exit route from the, the, um, entry route? Um, uh, exit routes are easy to tell because they're the ones you can see. Mm. Entrance routes, most of the times when those bucks go into the bedding, they come in from the downwind side, they swing around. They don't necessarily stay on a trail. Um, generally they swing off of the trail when they start getting close to like within a hundred yards or something. And they, they tend to swing the downwind side and smell the bedding area before they enter it. But when they get up in the evening to leave, they just get up and they go down the main trail. Now, what you will find is you'll find multiple trails. It ain't that one of them is the um, entrance, one's the exit. It's that at some time of the year, they exit one way because of one thing. Like say in rut, they're exiting towards the doe bedding area or towards where does feed. And uh, um, in uh, September, they're exiting towards acorns and, you know, in... Uh, um, October 1st or exiting towards corn, you know, or, or whatever they're doing, but they might have multiple, uh, exits, but the entrance is uh, always a little off. I mean, that's not to say they don't occasionally walk right down that trail and go in there and flop in, but it's a lot, a uh, lot less predictable in the morning. Um, the main trails you see are generally coming out of bedding. Hmm. That's a good tip. Obviously like in marshes and swamps, it's usually a little more obvious. I mean, um, and in that case, your entry and exit, exit trail could be the same, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. Sometimes, you know, you know, um, 
like in in marshes it's kind of the good thing is when they have when they want to uh, enter from downwind mm-hmm. a lot of times there's only like one trailer forced on because in the cattails right. they can't just walk anywhere and you can kind of uh predict that yeah what happens whenever you have a uh, two exit trails how do you decide which one you're going to set on oh uh, well when i'm scouting i'm trying to do detective work why are they betting here when are they betting here for what reasons and if i determine one of those trails i think goes towards doe bedding i'm going to think that that's probably you know late october early november probably not quite into november too much because once it's full rut they're not in those same bedding areas but that late october they're going to probably head over and see what the does are doing or go to where the does are feeding or whatever so yeah. um if i determine a trail's going up to an acorn flat that's probably when there's acorns up there um if i'm confused about it which is a lot of the time it's it's not as rocket science as i just made it sound mm-hmm. if you don't know or whatever you're just looking at the sign you're sliding your way in there and you're saying okay there's no fresh rubs here but there's fresh rubs on this exit you know and you're um you're hunting where the fresh sign is whether it's rubs whether it's tracks or whatever one trail's got you know a couple tracks on it they don't look real fresh and the other one looks to be uh rotor tillered you know yeah that's 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 how you judge it yeah sometimes you gotta you know like i'll uh i'll know of a bedding area say and uh, i'll check it out from hundreds of yards away because i know that when they come out of there there's a cornfield to go to or something and i'll walk mm-hmm. that cornfield and uh, if I hit sign on that cornfield coming from that direction, then I'll go to that bedding area and I'll sit on that trail that's going towards that corn. You know, um, things like that. Or I'll have a trail camera on a food source. You're getting pictures of a deer there that's coming from that bedding area. Well, it's, I can be right. relatively sure which trail he's going on to get there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Gary was down here scouting with, uh, we were scouting together last weekend down here, or Friday, I guess. And uh, we went to the spot he killed his buck in Indiana last year. And there was a, uh, you know, and he was telling me all this as we were walking in there. He, there's a, uh, um, you know, there's a lot of a lot of fingers that come down to this hub. And, you know, it, any of the fingers have, have a deer trail on them. You know, there's deer that, that use them. But there was a particular one that had a ton of buck sign on it. And it seemed like for whatever reason, the bucks were using that particular, um, that particular ridge or that finger that came down into the hub um and i just thought that was you know it's a good a good learning experience like you gotta mm-hmm. not all not not the bucks don't always use the same uh roundabout way just because there's a deer trail somewhere you know you gotta think right. outside the box a little bit um anyway this this particular scenario it was just it was you know more obvious so um it's not always you know there was just multiple bucks in there. So there was, they were leaving a lot of sign. Uh, anyway, um, is there anything on like whenever you're going to scout a, a new property is like, what are some deterrents for you? Like, like for a guy that's starting to look at maps and right now to, to uh, decide where they're going to start scout. So if I'm looking at a map deterrence. Yeah. Like I'm on my, I'm on set up, up here on my map on my computer screen and what, like, yeah. What's some things that you would, um, throw up a red red flag for you open hardwoods um real easy access um uh, man-made trails through the whole thing networks that get you anywhere you want to go yeah um, that's a that's a big one around here is um sometimes there'll be horse trails cut through everything and um mm-hmm. yeah then people use four-wheelers or whatever else they want to on them you know um, so the attractants would be the opposite in which would I, I'd be looking for like areas that are real wet, isolated from humans, um, real thick terrain, um, mm-hmm. hard to navigate stuff. Like, like say if, a, it, if you get rid of the swamp, say I go down by you, um, a spot where I got to walk a mile back there and then mm-hmm. you leave that trail drop through a valley and go straight up a bluff to get to something that somebody would have to walk three miles following trails to get to mm-hmm. you know I get a bluff and go to a finger or a point that i can be relatively sure nobody else is putting in that kind of work to get there um those are the things that would attract me to a property 
the easy access stuff. If, if guys can get anywhere, they will get anywhere and they'll kill everything. Oh, they just they'll won't be there. Age, right. They'll kill it before right. it gets to age. Yeah. Something else so I've been I, trying. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go, you go ahead. Something else I've been trying to kind of key in on around here is like little overlooked public land spots. Um, mm -hmm. cause we just, we got such big tracts of land, uh, and I'm, I'm trying to focus in on just some tiny things that I've noticed and that aren't so obvious on the maps, you know, mm -hmm. um, and I found some really good sign in some of them here recently. Yeah. But that's the that's thing something... too, when, you talk, when you talk about Stein, um, a lot of guys will tell me, well, I got this property. I've been scouting and scouting and scouting it and I can't find any big rubs and stuff. Uh, how do I know where these big bucks are? Pretty easy. They're not there. Mm -hmm. every buck rubs. I mean, if you've got, if you ain't got a tree on the property and your property is more than, you know, 40 acres and you can't find one rub that's waist high to the center, you don't have mature bucks there. Move yeah. on. Doesn't mean they won't show up later, but I'm saying, you, you know, every buck rubs and, and you don't have big bucks on every public property every year. You have to have backups. Most guys get locked in that they'll, you know, whenever I'm talking to people, I'm amazed. Even people that follow what we do, um, you, by by this fact, when you when you talk to them, most people will tell you, "Well, I hunt such and such swamp, or I hunt this uh, hill country area, or I hunt this property, or I hunt this WMA." And it's like, mm -hmm. really, that's all you hunt? Well, yeah, I know that spot really well. Well, if there's not a big buck there, that's where you're hunting. Part of my success is spreading out all over the place. And you see that with everybody that has a lot of success. I mean, yeah. look at yourself. I mean, you didn't kill all those bucks on the same public property by your house. No. You go all over no. the place. Right. Yeah. And that's why. But most guys lock into one property. They they, uh, they get a comfort zone. They go to some place where they feel good. Or they don't have to worry about getting lost, going to the truck or anything. And you really got to get out of that com comfort zone. And not be afraid of getting lost or you know those same guys will go shed hunting everywhere but they'll end up hunting the same spot yeah um your answer may be the kind of the same as what we just talked about here but um you got any tips for people to be like more efficient whenever they are going into a new uh, piece of public to uh, scout it out this time of year uh yeah i mean i would speed scout it I would go down uh, um, the edges, so the um, transition between uh, lowland and, and, and like like woods and, and marsh, or uh, mm -hmm. dogwood and cattails, or tamarack and trees. Or I'd follow those edges, and if I was in hill country, I'd follow that uh, leeward edge all over the place. And uh, um, I'm going to go for a ways, and if I don't see sign, and I'm going to go to the best stuff first. Best stuff I see on the map first. Okay. And if I'm not seeing any kind of uh, big rubs or at least historical big rubs, I'm out of there. Because you're going to get right on the sign don't you think of those transitions. And a guy's got to really get away from the scouting everything. Yeah. Uh, most guys will go in and they'll take a, a, a wood lot like that and they'll scout the whole, a whole big woods everywhere. And uh, they'll get all confused. Um, and I know this because when they come to me and ask advice, they'll show me a, um, an onyx thing that makes my head spin with a, a million marks on it where every rub is, you know, or every tree stand mark is. And it's like every scrape is. And I'm like, well, what do you care if there's a scrape in the middle of the woods? But there's a scrape there. You need to know where yeah. those are. It's like, no, you don't. Where you need to know where a scrape and a rub is, is you need to know where it is, where that deer moves in daylight. Yeah. Uh, deer are nocturnal and mature bucks, especially, and especially in pressured situations. So if a mature buck is up uh, uh, on his feet, 95% of the time, it's dark out. So you want to know where he makes a sign in the 5%. And that's going to be coming out of his bedroom or around his bedroom, going in or coming out, right? Mm -hmm. So you're going to want to look around those bedding features for the sign. You could care less what he does at midnight, you know. Right. I mean, even when you find a big rub in the middle of a woodlot, 
it might not even be a buck that lives on that property. You might just be traveling through. But when you find it going into a buck bedding area, there's only one reason they go into a buck bedding area. It's a bed. Right. Yeah. That's a good good tip. I mean, especially in hill country, I mean, you can just, you could spend your whole life freaking trying to scout everything, mm -hmm. you know, because it takes so long to get places just because of the terrain's rough. Um, the, big, the big one with hill country is people tend to, especially novices that are new at it, mm -hmm. they tend to glue to the bottoms. Mm -hmm. And the bottom that swirly wind that is so hard to hunt and you get busted constantly when really hunting high is much, uh, has much better results, but, um, they're not going to see the sign up high. You have to really look for it up high. Yeah. Because what happens is like the tracks and the trails and stuff in the lowland really stay there. That lower, uh, more moist soil and stuff will hold all the sign, the scrapes and stuff. We're up in a hill. You can walk right past the scrape, and maybe not even notice it in that sandy soil and stuff. Or mm -hmm. in the tr and they're not leaving tracks on those hard hills. Mm -hmm. So it'll look like there's a million deer down in the bottom and nothing up on the hill. But there's probably equal numbers. It's just that the ones down in the bottom are going to catch you with the swirling winds and yeah, you know all that. Uh, that's a real good point. I actually did that today. I had a, a friend of mine. He's a new deer hunter with me. Uh, today scouting it, or this year was his first year deer hunting and uh he was scouting with me and we it was a probably a mile or a mile and a half walk where we had to go to but we to get there you know I, there was there was a really nice point that i thought man that's there got to be bedding right there you know um and to get there we just walked the top like i just was walking as fast as i could to get there um and on the, on the top, every now and again, you'd see like a scrape, like a little scrape or something. And, you know, he would ask me like, oh, look at that. I'm like, yeah. And I, you know, kind of explain like, yeah, that's just, that's probably just some two-year-old like getting excited and making a scrape up here, you know. Um, I said, you'll know when we get into sign, like you'll know if it's the, if it's the right area. And I said, it might not be like, we may get there and it may just be just vacant of deer sign. I don't know yet. I've never been here. But uh, then on the map, I could tell there was a mil military crest on the map just by the topo lines. You know, there was a, a section that yep. was much wider on the topo than uh, mm -hmm. the rest of the, the topo lines. And when we got to that area where the military crest um, uh, started to, to get prevalent, I was like, okay, we need to drop down here. It's a, it was about that two-thirds of the way up. And we got down in there. I mean, they're just to tore up with deer. And it was green briar everywhere and really nice and thick uh, on the side of that ridge. Um, and I mean, we probably saw 30 big rubs, uh, there was some pine and stuff there and, uh, just, it was, it was an awesome area. Um, but yeah, like, I don't even, I guess I don't even think about it anymore. Like just, that's how, um, how I go, I go about it. And I just hear you say it I'm like, oh yeah, that's just what, what I do too. Um, now I would, I'll tell you like, you know, years ago it was much slower process. So, right. Um, you almost just have to go out and to, to learn where the sign is to, um, to get more. It's hard more for efficient. most people to take that where you just speed across the woods straight to yeah. where you need to be, but that's what you got to do. I mean, you gotta be efficient. So you learn properties. I mean, there's a lot of dead zone out there. And if you spend your time mm -hmm. scouting everything, you're going to run out yeah. of time and you're not going to find much. Yeah. Yeah, I get it. No, I'll fine tune an area a little more if I know there's a huge buck in there. Sure. I said it's a real big ten I'm after, right? Yeah. I'll go in that area and I'll, and I'll spend a lot more time. But I'm still I'm not up on the you know open hardwoods. I'm not checking out the grass fields and stuff. I'm going right into where I think he's bedding. But I might look at it a lot more in that area than I would someplace else, just because I want to know everything about that buck in that area because yeah of that particular buck. In hill country, do you hunt the tops at all? I mean, the, the very top of the ridge, do you hunt there? Um, I mean, do you, I, I, uh, I tend to find myself always like halfway down uh, the edge of the, the ridges. Um, I'm usually around the military crest, but uh, yeah, um, I do get above them sometimes. It just depends on, on the layout, the wind and how they're coming in and out of there. Um, but quite often it's, I'm, I'm, probably in that top third yeah um, 
you know, sometimes I'm lower. Sometimes I try to get them down low. Sometimes I try to get them up high. I try to avoid the uh, tight little valleys that make the swirling. Mm, it's horrible. Um, right. But uh, yeah. I try to, otherwise I'm just where they come in and out of there. Um, yeah. I like the tops of uh, draws, you know, especially if, to, you know, like you got a point and then there's a draw in there. Then if those draws are steep, it just puts those deer in an exact spots where the side hills, if you, yeah. you know, if you just go off on a random side hill, there'll be trails at different heights and based on wind speed and stuff, they'll be just at a different height. And quite often you'll be sitting in a tree and they'll walk way underneath you or they'll walk way over the top of you. But those draws that are real steep, it kind of makes a land bridge and it gets you out of that wind thermal. Like it'll be above it or below it or whatever. And um, you just get to the top of that. And when they, they rise up, it's usually above where the wind thermal is. So it'll be up a little higher. But there'll be a tangle down in that uh, in that tight draw, that runoff. Right. And then right above that, every deer, all the trails have to come together and make like a land bridge. Yeah, makes a funnel. That. Yeah, and that, those are really good spots to hunt. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, the deer will actually have like almost like a um, like a racetrack around the edge of the... Exactly, yeah. Uh, yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. No, I, I always, you know, when you, when you're out there with a, uh, essentially, you know, a new, a new hunter, they always ask questions and I'm always, I always had to like, think about it sometimes, you know, like he who's asked me about the tops, like, what would you hunt up here? And I was kind of like trying to think of, um, of scenarios whenever I would hunt the like very top of the ridge, maybe if there were some, some white oaks or something dropping up there that they, it depends. I mean, you know, if you're talking about when it starts to get rounded and way up top, yeah, probably not. Yeah. That's, that's what it was up there. Um, it was just a, you know, a pretty much the, there was an old logging road on top, but it was like the size of a four wheeler, but that's about how big it was before it dropped down. It wasn't very, uh, wasn't very wide. Um, anyway, we've been on here for a while. There's going to be a lot of questions. So you want to, want to start, uh, answer some, some questions about scouting. Why not? <laughs> I think it's a good idea. Um, I think you covered everything I was going to uh, ask about. All right. Mr. Peg asks, what's the best bedding cover for bucks in the timber? What do you seek out when looking for beds? Best cover so in timber is going to probably be thick timber. Um, high stem count. Um, and again, edge. Now, uh, you could have slightly higher ground if it's flat. You could have uh, slightly lower ground. You could have an edge where pines meet uh, hardwoods. You could, uh, you know, but there's going to be some sort of something in there that uh, creates bedding, and that's what I'm looking for. Uh, generally, it's going to be higher stem count, and uh, if it's relatively flat land, you're going to look at the highest and lowest elevations. And you're going to tell me it's completely flat and i'm going to tell you no it's not look closer yeah yeah um and i, I don't i'm not sure you know what kind of like you said what kind of timber he's talking about like may not be any big bucks if it's like a like dan yep. was talking about earlier like open timber um wouldn't be a place you would want to spend much time on unless you're just taking a walk i have seen spots where like for miles and miles and miles it's open timber like when you get into uh these big national forests and stuff, and it's all mature stuff that hasn't been cut, and there's still deer there. Mm -hmm. And those cases are really hard cases to hunt. And my main thing would be go find someplace else to hunt. But if you're gonna uh, try to force the issue and get in there because of some buck you know of or something, I would say he's probably bedding in a spot where, um, for whatever reason, some trees fell down, and there's a thick spot and a tangle in those trees, and probably uh, some sort of terrain feature. There's just gonna be like a small little hills there's going to be um little tight spots a creek that comes through that has an oxbow in it or something uh, it, it, what you got to look at is um the more you look at these beds the more you realize that the reason they're setting up in these spots isn't because they know an oxbow is good they're setting up there because it sets up with the ingredients for safety they can monitor one axis that a person's coming from and they have a good escape Whenever you find a mature buck's bedroom, when, when you really know you're in the buck, 
you got the buck you're after and he's a mature buck whenever i'm in his bedroom i'm always in awe that yeah. like wow you got this set up in a way that nothing can get at you while you're bedded here and and that's what you got to look at so they they're not just going to bed out in an open woods not going to do it they're going to find some scenario in there where they have the best you know uh, scenario for safety now um when I first went to uh, Iowa hunting, I'll, I'll never forget this. Um, I killed big bucks in Wisconsin and low numbers. And I went to Iowa where there's bigger numbers of bigger bucks. And I got into an area in uh, southwestern Iowa that was really open. It's just fields. There's a few tree lines and every now and then a little, you know, like uh, acre patch of trees. And it was amazing that these deer were bedding in like these little pockets and stuff all over the place. And I was like, you, you couldn't even hold a rabbit in something like that in Wisconsin. But what they were doing is they're bedding in the best thing they had. That's why I can't yeah. tell you exactly what they're doing in this open woods because I don't have a, a good enough description of it. They're going to be in the best terrain they got. I'm going to look at, you know, the lowest elevation, the highest elevation. I'm going to look at the edges. I'm going to look for patches of, of something different, like an island of a certain kind of tree that's out there which is usually an elevation change, but you might not be mm -hmm. able to see it because it's only a foot or two, but they're going to be on some sort of edge or they're going to be in, you know, and usually those things are obvious, not always. Some places are just really hard to hunt, but usually you can look at it and you can find something. You know, it's kind yeah. of like, if you think of this bass fishing, you know, it's like somebody asking me, um, okay, um, I'm going out to the middle of the lake where there's no structure at all. and I want to catch a bass. How do I catch it? got to have structure well there is no structure there's got to be something or there's no bass there well yeah. i don't think there's any bass here well yeah right exactly yeah right um okay we got a couple people wanting to get on here to uh call in i i dropped the link in the comments if anybody wants to call in just follow the link uh willie let's get you on here i don't know if you can hear us yep i can hear you guys hey how's really? it going um, my screen's black because I'm sitting in the car waiting for my daughter who's doing piano <laughs> lessons. So. Perfect. No um, worries. Dan, thanks for all you've done. I've uh, been listening to you since you and Mario did the podcasts years ago. Um, lots Shit. of great information there. So um, so my question is, um, I um, just started hunting a uh, river bottom that's fairly flat. Like you said, there's little dips in it here and there. Um, several thousand acres. A uh, windstorm came through a couple years ago and knocked a whole bunch of trees down. So basically did hinge cutting on it. So there's thick everywhere. Um, the DNR has fields planted in there, corn, beans throughout it. Um, where do I begin looking for buck bedding? Yeah, it's, it's a lot like the last question. Um, you know, they might be in those tangles. Um especially if there's brush growing inside those fallen trees. Um, but they might be right on the river bottom in oxbows. They might be in heavy grass along the river bottom. How big is the river? How wide is it? Uh, it's too big to cross for a deer. A couple hundred, okay. two, three hundred yards wide. Is it surrounded by grass? Um, farm fields. Farm fields, okay. Yeah, I think I'd probably get into the, to the woods where the tangles are. Um I would probably, uh, is it, is it like, uh, those, those, uh, fallen trees are everywhere or is there like isolated patches of them? Uh, 90, uh, not, maybe 70% of it. I mean, it's, it's not super thick, but I mean, you're not, it's not open woods where you're seeing two or 300 yards. I would have to guess if, if it's like you're describing, they're going to be at, uh, uh, high spots or low spots in those woods. Okay. So um, I, I was walking around in there the other day. There's snow, there's deer tracks everywhere in there. So there's piles of deer in there. Um, just mm -hmm. trying to figure out where the bucks would bed. I would think if, if I was a buck in that scenario, I'd get into one of them tangles mm -hmm. where I had a pretty good tangle behind me that nothing could come through. And I'd watch some open woods in front of me with the wind in my back. Okay. Okay. Um, and that's what I would imagine you're going to see. In, yeah. And that's, so I'm thinking the higher elevations are going to be at um, where those trees are knocked down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, can I over scout at this time of year? 
I mean, no, is that a so. thing? Okay. I don't think so. Because, I mean, yeah, turkey, people are going to be turkey hunting, squirrel hunting, whatever in their lane. So I think for right now, you got a free pass, you know, until Buck Green up. Okay. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Yeah. Sure. Thanks, no Willie. Really appreciate it. All right. We got Tough one more questions, call. Man. Yeah, I know. Scouting mm-hmm. ones are hard because, you know, it's such, it's, it's so hard if you can't see the, you know, what exactly what's going on. But you, hey. you can hear it, Stephen. <laughs> How's it going? Hey, Hey, good. Um, yeah, I got a couple scouting questions for you. So, um, I know you guys were talking about trail or uh, access, hunter access earlier. So, like, if, if you do have a property where there's just it's a big property, but there's there's tons of trails everywhere on the ridge tops, would you expect a buck to be in like the the few little spots where there aren't trails, or would you expect a buck to maybe be somewhere watching the hunter access? That's a good question. I think I'd look at both. Yeah. Um, I think I'd look at the stuff that's isolated away from the people, and I'd look at them setting up to watch people, um, especially near accesses, right where they come in and stuff. Um, I would try to find something overlooked in there where people aren't going. You got to remember, too, that um, those deer can be 200 yards, not even, from people walking all the time. And not care one bit if those people that never walk over there they'll just get used to it they'll learn those trails um so i think i would start looking for overlooked stuff i'd start looking for stuff uh along the road in between parking lots or trails um i'd start looking for the stuff that's too nasty for people to walk in and i would look for you know if there's a ridge overlooking one of those trails near an access I'd probably yeah. look at the top of that ridge and see if there's up there something up there watching. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and then have you guys ever hunted or scouted areas where there's been like a prescribed fire? Um, you know, maybe besides Dan's food plot or <laughs> <laughs> that was um... funny. <laughs> <laughs> they they burn off the Hedra National here a lot. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't uh, typically mess with it until it starts to grow back, uh, up a lot. It's a good place to go turkey hunting after they burn them up, burn it off. Is, um, it, I mean, would it be, so would it be good like growth the next year or does it take a couple years? I think the no. next year or two, depending on how much burns, um, mm-hmm. it might just be one year if it's a fast burn and there's still some stuff in there that stays, you know, like some trees make it. Yeah. Um, it might only take a, take a year and I think it'll be really thick and stuff. But uh, if it's really mm-hmm. burnt pretty black, it'd take a couple of years or two or three years. But uh, deer love that and thrive in it. You really get some uh, good and uh, unique um, plant life after a complete burn. Mm-hmm. That uh, it's like a food plot. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There's a, there's a good reason they do those and it, it does help uh, the habitat a lot. Yeah. Uh, I would, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be afraid at all to go look around. Um, if you got a burn area last year or whatever this mm-hmm. year. Yeah. Um, and then my last one was, do you guys ever, does your approach scouting or hunting change if there's a, a property that's bow hunting only versus bow and gun? I don't know that my approach changes. Um, I hunt some places that are bow only mm-hmm. and uh, I hunt them the same. I would anyway. I mean, I guess uh, the only thing I'm thinking is that, you know, gun hunters kill a lot more. They're more effective. So I like those properties, um, but I don't, I don't hunt them any different. Yeah. I, we have a a property um, not too far from here that I hunt that's bow only. And um, I like to go in there like a few days after gun season's open. And I don't know, it's, you know, I I killed a deer during gun season in there. And it's always, it's always in my mind, like, man, they, they get pushed in there, you know, cause nobody really wants to, I mean, most people don't bow hunt at all if, you know, during gun season. Mm-hmm. So uh, they just don't go in there cause they can't. So, yeah. Um, maybe worth a, worth a shot if you're okay with using a bow during gun season. Yeah. I think that'd be interesting for sure. Uh, anyway. yeah. So, all right. Well, thanks. Yeah. I've been... Thanks man. Good, good questions. Thanks. thanks. For coming on. Yep. Have a good one. All right. Let's see here. Dan 
how would you scout an island? Um, I've, I've been looking at a, a couple of hundred acres and a couple thousands all surrounded by uh, lots of deep water. Okay, so are these islands in cattails? Are they in swamps? Um, we'll are pretend they in that they're in, they're in uh, cattails. Okay, so um, for me, um, I look at the points coming off the island. I, I walk the perimeter of the island, the inside perimeter, and I look at the trails coming off. Generally in uh, cattails or in swamps, like any type of swamp, mm -hmm. it's surrounded by thick cover. It needs thick cover surrounding it. It can't be like uh, like floating bog that's just like a grass, or it can't be sawgrass. It has to be some sort of thick cover because they have to have escape. But they don't usually bed on the island. I mean, you'll you'll hit random deer that do bed up on the island, like, but it's usually young deers. But for the most part, there'll be a tapering point coming off of that island. And that tapering point is where they'll bed, right on the end of it. Um, and they'll monitor anything coming down that island towards them. And what I found over time is that the prominent, predominantly downwind side of the island, if it has a point, those points are generally better than, uh, than the ones that are set up for like an east wind, you know, that we don't get that often. Um, but they'll bet on both if one's better than the other. But I have found that, you know, um, probably 80% of the ones that I think are really good are on that downwind side. Um, but uh, it's usually a tapered off point to answer that question. And right towards the end of that point. And sometimes there's two different kinds of points to um, one point. The trees will come to a point and it'll end right in the cattails into, into cattails and water. And the other kind, which is probably a little more common, is it'll end, but there's little humps of dirt that keep going out. And you'll have a random trees and a brush off of the point out there. And those tend to be really good spots because they can bend out in the cattails out of the water, isolated by water. And those are usually the best ones. I do have islands, too, that the one whole side has bedding trees in it, you know, mm -hmm. out in the cattails and stuff. But they bed in the water. And come to the island. So the better islands too also have, uh, you know, I like islands that got oak trees or acorns or you know something to feed on. Yeah, I wonder what she means by deep water too. I wonder if, because a thousand acres that's a that's a big island. I wonder if she's like on a lake or something that has some islands or something on it. Um, yeah, I don't I, know. I, maybe river islands too. I know people hunt river islands. I'm yeah, I can understand that. Is she still on? Ask her. Yeah, if you want to elaborate a little more, you can, and maybe I'll see it at the end here. We can we can answer it a little better. Uh, that's a good question though, because you know those big islands in the middle of a, a cattail marsh or something, you know, there is a method to where they they bed out there for the mm -hmm. most part. All right, Joel asked if I find a buck bed this time of year, what are the chances he'll be bedding in that area in October? Okay, so are you finding a bed from October, or are you finding a bed that he just did now in the snow? I'm you thinking one he, did, he just found now in the snow, and that maybe he finds an antler in it, and he's like, oh, he bedded right here. Here's his antler. I'm going to kill this buck. I'd say the odds are pretty low. But I'd say if you uh still hunting that buck at the end of the season in January or the end of the, end of the season in December, your odds are going to get a little higher because they bed in different areas at different times of the year. And I would say that that's... If he's bedding there now, this is when he beds there, not in October. But there are bedding areas where those bucks bed there randomly throughout the year and come back. So there is a possibility. Yeah. I have the uh, my biggest buck I killed right where I picked up the shed. He shed that antler right in his bed. And then I crawled up on that bed and killed him. So it's a, it is possible. But that buck bedded there all the time. So, um, you, you know, um, but most of the time they have spots where they bed, they, they have little like two, three week periods that they bed in a spot and they move to another spot and they move to another spot. Yeah. Someone asked if we've ever shot a non-typical. I really haven't. Nothing crazy. I have, but, um, nothing really crazy. I mean, yeah. my, um. My uh, 180s buck is non-typical. Yeah, you know, it's 
zitter dead. Um, I shot uh, a three antlered buck. Um, I shot one that has uh, a velvet antler that grew around its face. Yeah, I remember, I remember that one too. Yeah, so I, yeah. I I tend to like the freaks. Um, I've I've had some run-ins with some giant non-typicals, some really nice ones. Yeah, um, I'm sure some people have seen the video from Shining and stuff of some of them, but um, really never paid off on any of those. Mm -hmm. We in Southern Indiana, at least we don't like. I don't know if our genetics we don't have a doesn't seem like we have a lot of them. I mean, there's obviously they get killed from time to time, but you know, some, some areas of the country just seems like it produces a lot of, uh, freaks like that. And then other places that don't, we're like, yeah. you know, I mean, you, you can tell like the world record or the U S record typical came from Southern Indiana. You know, it's like, we just got big typicals. It seems like, mm -hmm. um, I can only think of even a handful of all the years I've ran trail cameras in Southern Indiana that I've had like, not like a true non-typical on, um, a trail camera even um, we, we but, got a few around here but um I, you know it's, it's not easy usually by the time they get non-typical they're really big and old you know yeah they right. usually have a little bit of freakish stuff when they're younger mm -hmm. but it just starts expanding as they get older we had uh one buck that lived in the marsh behind my house um that was a non-typical that uh was nine and a half when it was shot and one of my neighbors mm. had all the sheds well almost all the sheds he had a couple of sets where he was missing one side mm -hmm. but he had uh back in those days you could put out food mm -hmm. and he had a big feeding station in his backyard and all the deer would come out of the marsh and eat there in the winter time and drop their antlers there yeah and he got a lot of the antlers from these bucks and uh um one of my neighbors ended up shooting him he was nine and a half he had his biggest rack at nine and a half he was what uh, score? 217. Mm, dang. At least he would have been 217. He scored two nine or 196. Mm -hmm. But he shot uh two or three times off. He hit it with a 12 <laughs> gauge through the antlers. Yeah. And uh him and his brother dug through the antlers, found a uh, dug through the cattail so they found the antlers. Yeah. And um uh, he uh took it in and had the rack fixed and uh fixed it, scored two two seventeen. Gosh. It was actually, I think it was, a, I don't know if it was on the cover, but it was a big article in uh, North American White Tail about that deer. Hmm. I had that same deer. The, the year he shot that, I had that deer at nine yards. Got behind really? a tree and like, like knew I was there or something. It just got really weird, stiff leg. It walked out and I couldn't get a shot. And oh, he man. Shot, he had a broken leg when he got it. Mm -hmm. He came limping. It probably wouldn't have made it to winter. Yeah. But it's kind of funny because people always say that they uh, they peak at like uh, six or seven or something. Yeah. And almost all the deer I see out here, they get six, seven, eight. They're always bigger <laughs> yeah. the older they are. You know, I'm sure there's a point where they go downhill, but. Right. They don't maybe make just it that far you easily. Got, you don't have that bad of winters, though. I mean, you know, yeah. if you got up to Saskatchewan, maybe they do peak when they're younger and better yeah. built. And, yeah. Yeah. All right. Joey asks, if you ever hunted urban areas with lots of interactions with humans, like small state parks or small properties. I've, I haven't really hunted urban areas before. And Charlie really Swamp's kind of like that. Yeah. It's pretty big, though. It's yeah. a pretty big area. I have hunted um, urban. I've hunted, uh, you know, in Wisconsin, some urban stuff. Um, it's usually not fun. I mean, you can get onto some really big stuff, but you're always having interactions with uh, angry people. And right, you know, one of the properties I hunted with my friend, uh, um, he leases this property, and it's up against a park and up against this uh, uh, well-to-do uh, community. And uh, man, he's always got these people coming on there. And he had this woman um, trespassing through there while he was hunting, walking her dog, and and uh, he says, you know, he wasn't. He wasn't like gonna gonna have her busted or anything, but he just said, "Hey, do you mind? We're trying to hunt here or something like that." And uh, she flipped out. You can't hunt here. And he says, "Yeah, we can." And uh, she started screaming at him, uh, saying she's gonna have him arrested and stuff. And she's on his property. He doesn't own it, but he has a lease to it. You know, right? So and, uh, she leaves and he leaves, and he comes back the next day, and uh, his uh, tree stands painted orange and uh oh no you know then he goes to another tree and uh, the uh, trees cut down and stuff 
and then uh, she spray painted stuff all over all of his stuff out there. And uh, he had a blind, like a camouflage pop-up tent. She spray painted that. Then they went to her house and they found the spray paint cans. The, the police, he called the police. They found the cans in her uh, garbage can and she had the paint on her fingers. Yeah, I'm with you there. I, I watch, I've, every now and again, I watch Seek One, those guys that hunt all those yeah, great big I, deer. I hate dealing with those people. Oh, I They're couldn't cool. imagine. I you couldn't know, imagine. You know, you gotta look at why. Why do you hunt? I I hunt because I love that one on one with nature and stuff. It's not just about killing big bucks. I mean, if you're into just killing big bucks, nah, yeah, urban's pretty good. Yeah, to I mean, me, I, I'll get out in the wilderness. You know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I get it. Like if if you live in town there and it's kind of your only areas around a deer hunt, you know, I probably would too if that was my only option, uh, for sure. Uh, but I, dude, I, I always just get almost, uh, I get anxiety watching those guys like hunting these little bitty properties where there's people like in their backyard, like, God, I don't like that. I'm just like, I'd, I'd rather not deal with that. You know, they got, a buck over, they got a property over here down the street that, uh, it's, uh, in a, uh, ritzy neighborhood and a lot of the people don't like hunting and stuff. Yeah. And man. they decided to do a, uh, park hunt. So they're going to allow hunting in there for bow only and uh, you have to apply and honest to god some guy from the community um he doesn't want you hunting or they don't want you hunting near people's houses or stuff and they don't want to have any problems so they just took one of their board directors or whatever and he put up tree stands and he's yeah. got like uh, 10 of them up and every morning every stand has a hunter in it every evening every stand has a hunter and you just rotate which one you draw and they literally hunt these tree stands every day, every morning and every evening from the opener to the end of the season. <laughs> I wouldn't even yeah. want to be involved in that. I know. That's what uh, my cousin moved, uh, lives on a lake like that has a housing addition around it. And the uh, they opened it up as a deer reduction zone. So you have an extra buck tag in there. And I got all mm -hmm. excited. I'm like, oh, yeah, dude, I got an in up there, you know. And uh I called him and he's like, he goes, you don't want to mess with it. He goes, they got, you got to check in with this one dude is like the keeper of all the hunting rights. And he has a list of all the landowners that allow you to hunt. And but if you kill one, you have to get a, in contact with him to, to go retrieve any of your deer. And I'm just, he's just like, he goes, it's a freaking mess. And uh, he's like, it's not worth it. So I didn't even, I didn't mess with it. But anyway, it's like all those things that get somebody in charge, you get some, power hungry nut <laughs> i know that's that's <laughs> essentially what he kind of was saying like the guy's like ah, this guy you know anyway let, we got another call in here dan flint can you see us How you doing, flint? yeah i can see y'all can y'all hear me all right <clears throat> oh yeah you're good all right cool i was a little iffy about my connection out here i just uh just pulled up at home you're but, good uh, <laughs> anyways uh <clears throat> so i actually just finished my uh first hunting season uh, tagged out with two bucks here in uh, Tennessee, but nice. uh, still still trying to figure out this whole uh, you know finding the beds and everything. So the one time I actually saw a deer you know laying down was one of the bucks I killed, and um, just kind of curious: will a wounded deer lay down in its regular bed, or the first opportunity that comes to to just lay down somewhere? Probably the first opportunity, I would say. The first good opportunity. I have tracked wounded bucks right back to their beds. Um, I shot a uh, pretty nice uh, ten pointer that was upper one fifties, and um, that bug I shot it coming out of a be uh, bedding area, and uh, it ran back to its bed and died, and was in its bed, turned around facing me, like watching for me to come, but laying there dead with its legs folded underneath it. So they they can go and bed back in a uh, in a uh, uh, good solid bed area that they do all the time, but I think a pretty good ch chance that uh, he's hurting, so he just laid down the first good opportunity he had. Gotcha. Because the, uh, the first time I saw him, we actually bumped him up out of a bed, and he ran about another fifty yards. Uh, I got a one lung uh, <clears throat> hit on him, mm -hmm. so. Uh, I was just kind of curious if where I found him the first time, would that be a typical like place or something I should look for when I'm looking for bedding or was that just somewhere he found to lay down? So I think he answered my question. 
most likely he just laid down there, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I appreciate it, guys, and uh, yeah. thanks for everything y'all do. I learned a lot from you. Thanks. Appreciate congrats. You on. Congrats thanks. on your season, man. All right. Hook Slinger, he asked, uh, if you're fairly new to hunting public land, is it better to branch out and scout new properties every year or focus on learning one or two areas more thoroughly, quality or quantity for hunting spots? Hmm. <laughs> you think? <laughs> um, I think... Uh, um, if you know that there's deer in that, on that, if it's a, you know, a, a bigger piece and you know, there's deer there, that's not a bad idea to, to try to, um, learn that area. Well, you know, if you're going in there completely blind, you also got to be careful because if there's no deer there, you're not going to learn much, you know? <laughs> I think, um, I think you're going to learn that property pretty quick. I mean, if you put some time into it, I mean, how much, how much scouting are you doing? If you get out a few weekends, you're probably going to learn that property pretty well. Yeah. And at that point, you just keep branching out. I mean, maybe the property is really huge. And you're just branching out from one area. But yeah. uh, once you know an area, it doesn't hurt you to keep scouting because even if you don't find another deer to hunt or a better area, you keep learning about deer. As a mm -hmm. matter of fact, I mean, uh, I'll take my uh, lunch break at work. I'll drive down the street to a park where I can't, I can't hunt. I'm not allowed to. Nobody is. And I'll go scout and I'll look at the bedding areas and stuff just because it's fun. Mm -hmm. You know, you learn a little bit, you see a little bit, you, you interact with the animals. I think the more you scout, the better. But yeah, you should learn that intimately before you move on to your next spot, I think. But I don't think yeah. it's that hard to learn it intimately. Something else is like, if you only have, if you've only scouted a couple spots, even if you're new to it, like it, it only takes a couple days to like that for that, those couple spots to be run, you know, for a while. If, you know, mm -hmm. you show up and there's a group of out of staters that came in and there's five of them or something in there, you know, just something like that could happen. Um, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you're like, crap, I'm kind of starting back over here. Mm. Yeah. But it... yep. Were you going to say something else? Yeah. I was going to, I was going to say the more you, the more you scout, you, you know, um, the more you're going to start to see trends and put things together. Yeah. The more you're going to start to understand, Bedding, the more you're going to start to understand why what you saw over there is happening. Yeah. You, you, you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. So I think the more you look at, the better. It's almost like practicing. You know, it's like mm -hmm. you're just yeah. getting out and seeing different scenarios. And um, it's like the, you, you know, um, we both know guys that, uh, you know, get on some exceptional farm and they start killing giant bucks. I mean, they get a lease for 10 grand or something and, and they're shooting booners every year or whatever and they're, they're like yeah. i'm better than you because look at these bucks i shoot and they've got five tree stands they wrote out and that's all they've ever hunted since they're 20 you know 19 or 20 right and then yeah. all of a sudden they lose that farm and all of a sudden they ain't that great of a hunter no more you know like getting out of your bubble and uh really going out and learning how to hunt is yeah you know you do that by scouting right right thanks for the donation josh we appreciate it What's what's fourteen dollars Canadian? What's that? A little little less than I think their exchange rates more than ours. I don't know. With Biden in office, that's probably like six hundred dollars. Well, you gotta get off here soon, Dan, because people are saying your buddy's gonna be on tonight. Then you gotta Our listen buddy. to it. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh man, we have a, we had a couple other donations here from Hook Slinger. We just answered his questions. Thanks, man. I uh. I appreciate it. All right. Another one here. Andrew, he had a, a donation and a question. Thanks, Andrew. We'll try to answer this for you. He said, Upper Midwest versus Adirondacks in uh, northern New England. Same winters, way different deer density. Is the difference going to be agriculture? Mm. I don't know. Probably. I, I think if, if there's no agriculture in one and there's a whole bunch of agriculture in the other they're probably going to be more deer is, yeah was well, he talking about deer density way different yeah yeah you can hold more more deer in egg country for yeah. sure um if you if you do get more deer in the egg you know in, in the mountains you know um they're gonna eat all the food 
they're gonna eat all the plant life and eat it up because there ain't that much but uh yeah you know. it just like it just can support more deer is i mean that's the thing if there's ag you can still, you you still have high numbers in the in the mountains and stuff and, you know part of it might be uh hunting pressure and stuff people don't realize how hard it is to to get a, a good population of deer nowadays people are kind of spoiled they think yeah, that uh you, you know they look at somebody's population you're like why is yours so bad and it's not really that bad you go back in time and it used to be like that everywhere yeah i mean i remember yeah. when i was a kid i mean you couldn't even get a doe tag um uh, for a while there they, were, they would uh they would give you a doe tag just a few people, you, if you're lucky enough to draw, and you'd have to draw with 13 people, and they'd call it a party tag. And a lot of guys even then would burn the tag because they didn't want you shooting a doe because the population was so low. When I first started hunting in south, uh, southern Wisconsin, people used to always go up north to hunt because there's no deer down here, and they'd say I was crazy. You know, there's no deer down here. What are you doing? And that's how low the population was. Um, right. It took a long time of not shooting does to get that population up to something, you know. So I don't think it's as much that we can hold more deer in the agricultural land. Um, obviously, we can. You're absolutely right about that. But I do think that if the, the numbers are like, you, you know, um, five per square mile in the mountains, it could hold more than that. You know, it's just the numbers got to get up. I mean, yeah. It takes a long time. They only have, you know, you know, one or two fawns a year. Yep. Did the Chinese balloon have any collections with the uh, uh, buck betting on it? Well, Biden ripped us off on that one too. I mean, he's always <laughs> up to get us. He shoots down over the ocean. We wanted to see where it landed because that would have been a good hunting spot. Right. It would have drifted I wanted into to the... shoot it down over Wisconsin because wherever it floated down, <laughs> that would have been the spot. Oh, it's a freaking crazy time we're living in right now, Dan. <laughs> I watched a I watched a documentary on Netflix called The Social Dilemma the other night. I think we're all screwed, man. Yeah. It's essentially about how social media has kind of run society. It has. Um, yeah. It's like a bunch of uh, a bunch of 27-year-old uh, computer nerds deciding on uh, what we should, how we should think and what we should watch. It's like, oh, God. <laughs> right. Um, you, you, you get mad at somebody for doing something wrong at work and you yell at them and a grown man starts crying. You're like, Jesus yeah. Christ. <laughs> different times we live in nowadays now. we can't yell at people i can't be angry old man anymore oh <laughs> uh, yeah right um no more clint eastwoods there's a uh, i am going to be at the workshop next weekend yeah next weekend everybody i saw a few people asking uh that i'll be there saturday and sunday um yeah adam we we uh He's asking about if we have a schedule for upcoming show dates and start times. Um, I, I if you're if you're talking about this show, we usually do two a week, and one of them is usually for sure on Thursday nights at seven, <laughs> or it will be now. And the other ones will probably be Monday or Tuesday, like we're we're doing now. It'll depend. Like I think Dan last night had a different podcast he did, so we did it tonight. So we try our best to make them consistent. But if you follow me on Facebook, we always kind of post them there early in the day so you know um but but uh thursday nights is when we are going to try to do them more consistently and then during deer season it's yeah this is more a bonus for now right yeah yeah just um just to get some more content out there to you guys essentially um we've been on here for about an hour and a half we have another donation i have to get to here mike thanks for the donation um what topo maps and weather sites do you all use? I really like hillmap.com. Yeah. Hillmap, uh, you can switch around. You can have uh, the same map on both sides of the screen and, and have one side have topo, one side aerial. And uh, uh, that's a pretty good site. I like that one. Um, yeah. Weather sites, I don't know. I float around all over the place. Yeah, me too. Weather stuff. Whenever I'm looking for a specific topic like history or something, I just search weather history and something will come up. It'll 
you know, weather history in a certain area. If I don't like what I see, I just go back and Google and look a little harder. Yeah. Um, I don't, I, I don't have like a lot of faith in any of them. It seems like, I don't know, maybe some people in the comments can throw out their favorite weather app to see forecasts and stuff, but it just seems like, um, uh, they're not always real accurate. I know, yeah. just all all year, I, mean, I, would, I would be looking at the uh, the computer at work um, and looking at the weather and saying, oh, it's going to be nice. It's going to be in between storms. It ain't going to rain till nine o'clock or whatever. And uh, um, Carol would call me up and say, hey, are we going out tonight? And I'd be like, no, I'm hunting. And she'd be like, it's going to rain. I'm like, no, it's not. It's not raining until nine. And she'll be like, I'm on the weather right now. And I'd be like, I'm on the weather right now. Yeah, and they can agree. I mean, the t between the channels, it's a matter where you look. So if you you know if you're worried about the weather, just shop around. You'll find some place that tells you it's right. Nice. Gives you, gives you the right answer. <laughs> um, I use Onyx a lot. That's I mean, that's kind of one I I've tried about every app or whatever to look at, and I've just gotten used to Onyx. So it's hard for me to switch over to a different one. Um, I would if there was a you know one that I thought was better whatever um thanks for the the donation slogworth appreciate it we got one more here have you ever talked yourself uh gavin man thanks for the donation we'll try to answer your question here have you ever talked yourself out of a spot assuming nighttime sign i may have done that a few times this season in overlooked spots yeah i'm sure i have yeah it'd be easy to do in overlooked spots like he's talking about because you kind of maybe assume that there's no deer here, you know, cause it's overlooked. Well, yeah, I, I would imagine I do it all the time and don't even know it because a lot of times deer do get further than you think, you know, yeah. um, otherwise nobody would have success, right. Unless they did exactly what we're doing. Um, you, you know, I've heard of people shooting deer in the middle of the woods over by me that are just huge. I mean, we had a guy I work with who uh, went to the same marsh I hunt and parked in the main parking lot where everybody parks on like the, the, Tuesday or Wednesday of gun season, gets out of his car, walks 50 feet into the field, and a giant buck walk, jumps up and he shoots it. I mean, you never know what will happen. Yeah. <laughs> you just don't. You don't. Yeah. You know? Right. But that nighttime yeah. sign, uh, sometimes they do move in those places. It's just, uh, it's really more about odds. It's not about it. It's impossible. I mean, it's not a bad thing to go sit on a scrape line or sit on a rub line. I mean, it's better than sitting in a woods that has no sign. But what we're doing is trying to up our odds by pushing as close to that bedding as we can. So, yeah. There you go, everybody. There's our uh, postseason scouting show. <laughs> Thanks for getting on, everybody. There's a bunch of people on. It was fun. Sorry if I didn't get to your question. Um, we'll try again next time. You guys, everybody have a good night. We'll, we'll see you later. Thanks, everybody.